Well, <clears throat> I'm going to try something here. I'm not sure how how useful this will be. I, I hope it's a little bit useful. I'm going to really kind of practice discussing some case studies now. And this, this goes along with the kind of essence of, of project finance. The case studies I've chosen, and sometimes I've gotten in trouble for this, the, 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 the case studies I've chosen are the, 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 uh, uh, some famous ancient history case studies and case studies that are just all very current. We've got the latest the little terms in a, in, in a contract for me are not very interesting. Case studies that were either dramatic su successes or failures or either both or you can judge for yourself. That's what I'm trying to do. Now when I do these case studies, Let's see what I have next on my slides. I, when I when I try to do these case studies, I I <coughs> sometimes make a mistake. I'm not sure how I'm going to do this in the videos. If you really watch this video, <laughs> great. I'm going to try to leave a little bit of time and hopefully have you think. There's no way I can really make it interactive, but I want to see if I can practice making these a little interactive. So my first case study is from 1996. It's about a project financing of these LNG liquefied natural gas uh, machines. So this is, is, is maybe very bad because it's uh, fossil fuels, but let's go through the issue. Now, I basically uh, 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 want you to answer something simple. I'm trying to argue here. Well, I shouldn't argue anything. I'm going to let you answer it. Could Qatar have hosted the World Cup without project finance? That's the big question. Is it, why did I say simulate? I'm, I'm not sure. What's, are, 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 are some people's favorite really bad guy is, it is ExxonMobil. I'll, 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 I'll include a little video about this. How did this project that, <clears throat> okay, I'll give you a hint. Qatar got the World Cup, so they probably it probably worked. How 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 was it successful? What were the risks and the the, the mitigations? And you know, uh, uh, we'll see in just a minute. The the uh, 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 ex, if 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 the state of Qatar wasn't a a sponsor of this, would there have been some 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 real risks? And then. I'm going, I, I, I wasted a little bit of time on making a model and I want you to further delve into a couple of these issues with a very simple model, not with some really fancy model. Ah, mm -hmm, so I did this right away. Huh. I'm going to pause already. This is really, <coughs> hopefully, this video, which... Uh, really whatever if you want to watch it fine but it's helpful to me i'm going to have you read this thing it the the the, the project had bonds not bank debt and there was a pre-sale report that destruct the 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 disc discussed the strengths and the weaknesses of the uh, uh, of the project finance and i think just by having you take a very brief, very, very brief skim of this report to see how they look at strengths and weaknesses. It's difficult to find, it's difficult to find banking analysis and find, oh, God, 
God, I try to find these where you, 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 you find out exactly how the banks and the credit people look at this. There's a scam phone call I got my thing. So here's the, here, here's the issue. This is Qatar. This is, there it is. And this is this gigantic natural gas field just right next to Qatar. And let's go through the next thing. And here's what I imagine. I imagine in... 1996, somebody from Qatar, hmm, maybe he can't speak English very well, and I can't imitate a good accent, oh, I'm, or, or I can't do it, I can't do it, but he calls somebody in New York, says, I'm from Qatar, we've got a big natural gas field, I want to invest a few billion in making this gas field. Can you just give me a sovereign loan? Can you give me a non-project finance loan? Can you give me a loan for, for, for this project? Okay. And Qatar at the time was rated below investment grade by Moody's and I don't know, Standard & Poor's must have just kind of upgraded it, maybe, but okay. And there's what Qatar looked, uh, Doha, I guess, looked like before the project finance, and here's what it looked like after the project finance. So you know the answer, but you don't know how they got there, perhaps, okay? So, uh, let's just look at a couple of things. There, there were a couple of transactions we'll, we'll look at. They made these, I don't know why they call them, LNG trains, and you had to finance not only the, 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 this themselves, but a little bit of how they're going to produce from the oil field. So that was the production. They needed about $3.4 billion. Now, I imagine when, when uh, somebody from Qatar calls somebody in New York, the person... In New York said, "What? What? What are you? What are you talking about? This is, this is quit, 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 tar. Why don't you have a Q U in your your country? Nick, quit, Are you kidding me? I'm. You're, you're not even investment grade. Hang up the phone. Don't waste my time. Okay. Whew. So <laughs> I got red, and they were gonna produce this many tons. Now the other thing I want to show you." is when I talk about natural gas, you talk about, mm, if you're in Germany, you say natural gas is euro per uh, a, a kilowatt hour. That's the price of natural gas. If you're in U.S., you say a, a price per MMCF or per MMBTU. You don't say price per ton. Oh, what are they doing? we got to convert this tons to, to, to MMBTUs, and, and when I did this case at first, oh my gosh, how could I convert a ton? Uh, but now you Google it, and it's just changed. It makes it so much easier. And then 30% was mobile. Now it's, of course, ExxonMobil. Okay, after the merger. This was before the ExxonMobil merger. So how important was the fact that a little bit of the minority interest was not the state of Qatar? Hmm. And then they got some EPC uh, uh, contracts. And the question is, how good were these uh, off-takers? Here's what they were able to do. They were able to uh, uh, get 3.4 billion of USD. Some of it was, was with Exxon, uh, uh, banks, and some of it was with uh, 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 these the, this really big issue of bonds, and they got a long-term maturity. Oh my gosh. They did, they were able to sign a couple of revenue contracts with Japan and Korea, and I think if you've got some revenue contracts, that's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, but when they signed these revenue contracts, and partly what I have you do with this case is I have you uh, uh, go 
and retrieve a little bit of data. And I hope I don't have any Excel open. And what, you, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever used any of this. For me, I, I, I just, I, I keep coming back to it. If, if I do something that's completely obsolete, so this is in chapter one and, and then in, in commodity prices and, and, and you go to commodity prices and they did, they had the volumes fixed, but not the price of natural gas. So what we can do is go to this one called, and I've got too many of these things because I mess around with them, and I show you how to, uh, uh, and this perhaps is the easiest one to do, how to just take this wonderful file from the World Bank, and I give you the where you can find this thing, and then let's read the data, okay? Oops, I hope I didn't press it twice. Uh, okay, and I have you read the data, and then when you read the data, as of the time I'm making this video, we're all the way to the first month, and here's the oil price, and here is the, the natural gas price in the U.S., which ooh, it increased a tiny little bit. There was a little bit of cold weather, maybe. And in Europe, the price, ooh, it's kind of come down relative to the U.S., even though it's the winter time. And there is the price in Japan, which right now is a lot higher. Okay, I hope you can see that. And then I think, well, how valuable is it, it is to make flexible graphs with, the, with, the, with all of this. So if we just want to look at natural gas, maybe we can just look at natural gas. Now, we can't look at Europe anymore because of the craziness. Let's look at U.S. versus uh, 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 Japan. And then huh, we could put them on the different scales, but let's put them on the same scale. And you can see that they used to be okay, and then shale gas came in, and now Qatar had to compete with this shale gas. Why wasn't this thing a dramatic failure? Because, because you could make their gas so much cheaper in the in, in, in the U.S. Maybe that's kind of a question. And then we have the price that was actually paid. In, in 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 Japan, and then we can look, and this is. Now, it's kind of interesting. When you look at liquefied natural gas, it said it's got a volatility. That's measured as the standard deviation of the rate of change. That's how you do it. But natural gas in the U.S. has this enormous volatility because it had all these kind of things. And the correlation is only 33%. But then you change this, and all this is, you can work through all of the, 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 the value of being able to kind of make a, a good presentation, this I call a statistical presentation, and we don't have any statistics, oh no, that looks like they're kind of unrelated, but then you just click on a little macro that puts them on different scales, so we have a primary and a secondary scale, and you can see a correlation of 90% immediately, and then you can, and it took me a while to do this, put this in, in, in real US dollars or, or nominal, and you can see kind of these periods of the high oil price. And you have to answer, is this mean reverting or not? I kind of say it is mean reverting. I kind of say we can be sure that, not absolutely sure, that we're not going to hit a really, really low price or an astronomically high price that all these people were talking about on and off. Maybe you're going to say, oh gas and oil will become obsolete because they're fossil fuels that might be really good. I wouldn't even disagree with you, but that's, we look at these kind of things and then you can look at so many different commodities. Let's look at how soybean meal uh, uh, compared to whatever. Let's compare that to oil, okay? Uh, whatever. And <laughs> it's actually kind of correlated. So many things are correlated. And if we want to even start it a little bit later on, uh, uh, we can do that. So the first thing is just to kind of get familiar with this stuff. All right. And, and maybe instead of, let's compare it to some other stuff like uh, rice in Vietnam. I, I don't know if there 
it's all that. The rice in Vietnam has a lower volatility, and both of these have a lower volatility. And you could say, ah, maybe we can project finance something that depends on the price. Maybe we can do some kind of project finance for a, 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 a uh, agriculture. And if it's sustainable agriculture, I think that would be really cool. But the, the problem is the, these are all very local prices sometimes. And, and why is it just taking a minute to, to go through that? Maybe it didn't have a, the historic data. I'll just leave that. Okay. Oh, yeah, it did. Okay, I'm closing that. That's just a little bit of discussion. And the first question about all this is, is is, you know, is it mean reverting, okay? And so this project had some, uh, uh, it had some price risk. Now, the next thing I have you do, and I'm not sure I'm going to do some of this, maybe I'm going to do just one of them. How's that? So then I say, okay, let's look at, case studies go to chapter three and in chapter three you go to the one called uh, 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 just a minute just a minute uh, uh, come on come on this one which was the, the uh, oil and gas cases i hope is not the one and it wasn't I made a model here and i made the lng case oops not that one. Okay, I try to collect a little bit of this. It's not very good sometimes. And there we have this this pre-sale report. Okay, and this pre-sale report. Here's it's kind of good. It goes through the 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 project itself. You don't really have to read that. It talks about the the uh, the. I don't know. And this is, by the way, the second one, not the first one. So it's a little bit confusing. But what I like about this is they just list some of the strengths. So they said elimination, for example, of most of the volume risk. And they talk about most of it, maybe not. And then they say, well, is this a boring... Uh, they say we don't have any natural gas supply risk shipping availability risk and then they say here practical elimination of the construction risk so all i want you to do is not look at this thing uh, uh, i want you to kind of copy this practical elimination of the construction risk just copy and put it into the a, a construction risk little category, okay? And I'm not sure if this is going to work. I just kind of thought this is almost too easy, but maybe it'll we'll take just a, a couple of minutes and do this because then I I fill these in and they say, well, it's boring technologies. There's no operational risk. They we talk about the construction overrun risk being mitigated by date certain and fixed priced EPC contracts. We talk about the supply risk being which we just talked about being eliminated, the volume risk, which is the 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 contracts for the first project at least with with uh, 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 um, Korea and Japan, and then the price risk, and this is kind of the one I, I, I almost want to really Let's see if we can find this price risk. And they say that here, the project's competitive cost structure, and they say with DSCRs of above two in stress scenarios, and you can do this at 11 US dollars a barrel. So that's good. They kind of go through this, but then let's look at the value of of, of just a little financial model. Okay, and what I did here is, I hope, and I opened the wrong one, and this is good practice for me. Oh, God. Uh, 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 Russ Lefan model. This is the one. See, I've got to organize this just a little bit, organize this a little bit better. 
and they gave you uh, uh, in 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 this pre-sale report they give you a nice little model and you don't really need much more so once you have this model you can try to go to my read PDF to Excel and it's going to be not as smooth as you you want and each time you get these different horrible little things when you try to do it maybe you have a better program that does it because you can afford it I can't and then they have a nice little sources and uses and they, here's all the debt compared to the total so 10 whatever 70 some percent and this is the cost of the construction and they show the amortization schedule. They show where the volumes are. This is kind of nice. Then they show the prices that they have assumed. But it would be really good. For example, this is the U.S. Henry Hub, which it turns out was a lot lower because of the shale gas. So you can say, oh, that's a bad thing. And then, and, but remember, they were selling it not to, they had some U.S. sales in this, but not really. And then they have the revenues. And what you can do is take these, this data and say, okay, let's back into the price they're assuming for the revenues. Now, remember one thing, that the revenue they realize, the revenue they realize is, the, is not the price, is not from the price people pay in Korea and Japan from that sheet because the, 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 the shipping itself, they do not own the ships, at least there was nothing in here, and, and that's, I'm pretty sure that's not the case. So somebody else has to pay those shipping costs. So uh, 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 we have to look at things, and, and then you go down, and for me, oh, 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 and the real question is this operating cost. How efficient are they in the, in, in the cost analysis? Now, it only had one line, but let's see what we can do with this model. So you go to this model, and you first get all the numbers typed in, and I kind of copied them and typed them in, and then we get what revenues they have, and, and, and let's just, I'm, I'm going perhaps too quickly through this, so we start with the, 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 the volumes and then get the operating cash flows. Okay, these are all just typed in so far. Oh, this A, B, and C is too big. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. See, if you put nothing in A, you can get all the way to the bottom and the top immediately, I guess. And then you can put it in B and, and, and do all your generic macros and all that. Okay, and then we, we uh, 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 get their EBITDA. And then, the, of course, they didn't show what the project IRR is, because, but they did give you this pr uh, 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 construction cost. So I assumed, uh, and I did this based on the thing, I just assumed that they're spending it flat over five years. Now, now that might not be right. So on this one, there's a little formula. If they spend it over three years, then the IRR is only 29%. So that's a pretty good IRR, and you have to ask, why can they get such a high IRR? Now you're asking better questions. The first thing is they did mitigate the construction risk. They did mitigate the volume risk. But now you've got to ask, What's going on here? How can this be have such a low break-even point? And then they give you the, the, the prices, and then you can make a little cash flow waterfall where you put in the debt, and nicely they gave you the debt, and they didn't start any debt repayments for a few years after, they, after the construction is finished. And then they gave you a, well, I computed the equity IR, which we'll talk about in a minute. Maybe we we're starting to answer about the World Cup here. And then they gave you these DSCRs, which were astronomical. Okay, so they can afford. The whole idea is they can afford a little bit. And then, well, now let's, let's just focus on the oil price risk or the gas price risk. And let's understand, let's understand something I learned many, many years ago that if you convert oil to gas, you can use about a factor of six 
times and you convert, just like I said, the, all the tongues to MMBTUs by going and looking at Google. So we have some of those and that's what you get used to doing. And without, uh, you know, I'm the, of course, I love to get very complicated with all our sculpting and everything else, but this is a, is a model. And now I'm just going to skip to the end. And this is the base case. This is the case they had. And then we took that, I took that thing, and here's the DSCRs of five. And then I computed the levelized cost. I'm making a different video on levelized cost, really taking the Lazard numbers and dissecting them and showing how you really should do it. But this is the dramatic thing. The levelized cost of producing natural gas was 3.61, and that's with a whole lot of inflation. It started a lot lower. The Perhaps I should have made a little graph of that now. See, it makes me think. Here's the sources and uses of funds that you like to see. Here's the project IRR and the, the, the equity IRR of 162%. And then let's put the actual oil price in. Oh, <laughs> And here's what you have to do. You have to understand what the margin is because they only realize this, this, this natural gas price after the margin. So, so if we put a high margin in, they receive a lot less. <laughs> but I think the margin it probably was somewhere around one USD. Okay, and I inflated that even. I think you can look at that. And then project IOR is 100. 21%. That's, and, and, and I'll just start, that if you just do a sum, nothing fancy, just a sum of all the cash flow to the equity, including the amount they take out of their pocket, for just this one project, which is something like 20% of their total project, uh, hmm, that's pretty nice. That's 274 billion USD. Now, if you did a break-even oil price, what you could decide to do was, well, should we look at the DSCR or the PLCR? In this case, they, 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 there could have been some extra life at the end, so maybe that should have really been the LLCR. I'm going to change the LLCR. Okay, and then we can push the oil price down. Let's push the oil price down until we get a DSCR of 1. Now, that's not very good, but the DSCR1 is somewhere around here, and we've got all this extra thing, so maybe we should push it down until we get a... But they said the... Here's what they said. They said the DSCR of about 2, and I'm looking at the minimum DSCR, which might not be right, and certainly I don't get 11... I don't get 11 USD because they didn't add this margin in. They, they basically did it with no margin. Even if you do it with no margin here, and this illustrates what you really want to do with a, with, with a model. Oh, now I can push it, push it down to about two maybe, the DSCR. Let's push it down to two. And I think these little little gimmick tools and all that are kind of valuable. I, I, I did it too slowly. Oops, we put two. Okay, I didn't get 11, I got 16. It's still extremely low, of course. But if they had a, if a, a really re realistic margin of, let's say, 150, maybe a little bit less, then to get to get the, the, the break-even point, you don't get you don't get that crazy 11. I think that was a little bit optimistic. And you, when you, so when you read these things, you have to be a little skeptical. Now, okay, let's put it back to the actual oil price. This is what you want to do when you just take somebody else's model. And it's, I hope it's a little bit fun because 256 billion and then you realize that, uh, uh, so, so I wanted you just to think about things, and, and now I have, to, I have to do this. I have to give this model to everybody and just ask a couple of questions. What's the, what's the real cost structure? What's the O&M cost? And I think that, that, that levelized cost of 
actually producing gas is is is, is the big deal, and perhaps we sh that it, that's that should have probably warranted a graph in the summary. So I'm going to go and do that, and that break-even price of oil, which was a little trickier, and not exactly what was in that report, and you can see the value of at least interpreting a model, and it doesn't have to be some big fancy model. If I would have done a diagram of this, I would have said, oh, okay, we would have marked in a pencil or something, I don't have a, I, I don't know how to do this. The break-even price is 11 if we use a margin. The EPC cost was a fixed contract. The off-taker, I almost don't care about this, but if it's in Korea and Japan, it's really good because they don't have any anything else. By the way, that really tight correlation that we saw between oil and LNG was precisely because of these contracts. The rating got an A rating above this, this, this SPV. Maybe that should have been a different color. Uh, and here, for me, was the big deal. I would imagine, if I sit here and imagine what was going on, I sit and imagine that ExxonMobil was beating up on those bankers and saying, oh, the, the break-even price is 11. They were showing that they made them all. They were pushing this and re really getting this getting this thing done. So even though if we made a if we made a ring fence around here, remember a ring fence, it would kind of be here. Right. Remember that? I should be able to make a ring fence, but I I just couldn't do that. Exxon and Mobile or Mobile is outside the ring fence. And uh, but it's still having them in the transaction was essential because of that phone call we had with uh, 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 New York. So they got the World Cup and then I had you kind of do things. What's the population? The population, somewhere I put the population here, it's like 113,000. Can you imagine how much, and, and, and that, that project of 29 tons was, was only 77, so that wasn't, they had that 240 billion or whatever, you have to multiply that by about three times, and that's how much those 113,000 people who actually are not expatriates got, and you can see how much reserves Qatar has. This is Iran, which must be right next to there. Russia has more, U.S. has a lot less. Okay, enough of that one. Now let's go to a second one. I hope I can do, I'm going to do this hopefully a little bit more quickly. This is my second case, and I've discussed this elsewhere, and this was a Harvard case study, and this was for a really big combined cycle plan. And now for this, uh, 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 for this case study, uh, we're going to open a model, we're going to look at the Harvard case study, and we're going to look at the difference between kind of a, a commodity-based project and another one. Again, this is just too good, some of those things. I have some questions. We'll see why I said this. Do you think they were good missionaries? GE, Bechtel, and Enron, the three sponsors. What do you think about IRRs and, and political risk? I want you to think about this. What if you had to make a diagram and note in the diagram what's really, really important? What would you have noted? How could you uh, 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 mitigate some political risk? Okay. Now, when you think about a project like this, in general, maybe not even for this project, because Enron tried to trick it a little bit, but in general, this plant does not run all the time. It runs when somebody else asks it to run, and it has to buy fuel according to somebody else, not you. And if you want to make an analogy, you can look at uh, renting a car. Here, it's a Rolls Royce or something you can rent, okay? Now, when you rent a car, I know the, the rental companies sometimes don't charge you for the kilometers, the mileage, 
okay, I can't say it. <coughs> you see them. Uh, uh, but they don't. You have to pay your own fuel. So if you run the car a whole lot more, you're going to spend a whole bunch of fuel. It would be crazy for the rental car companies to say, okay, we, you have a, here's your flat price, and we're going to pay for all the fuel, no matter. So if you run it a little bit, eh, then we do better. If you run it a whole lot, they do better. In fact, if you had an arrangement like that, what you might do is you, you just try to, if it's a fixed price, you just try to run it. You have to have incentives to allocate risks that are not controllable. That's a non-controllable risk. So to get into this, the first thing I will have you do is we just have kind of a discussion about this normally and may, per, perhaps we'll, you know, I don't have people fill this in. Oh, so if, the, if, you're, if, you're, if you're having this production plant and you don't control the output, then I split the risk allocation discussion into two parts. Part one is allocation between the buyer, like the this one, the buyer of the, the renter of the car and the owner of the car. Okay? The off taker, that's the 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 renter. The uh, 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 the owner is the owner of the, the rental car company. In terms of the generation level, that's like the mileage on the car. The investor can't take that risk, the off taker. So you'd fill this in with the off taker. The, on the next thing, which is the generation level from changes in the availability, and we can't, we, I don't think we can really go back to our, 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 our rental car company right now, but if the plant breaks down, who should take that risk? Because they've done a crappy job in maintaining the plant. They've let all the pipes get clogged. Well, that should be the investor, the owner. This should be the off taker because they cannot control that. This should be the owner. And then we get into cost overrun risk, and I hope everybody will say, ah, yes, this is the big deal. This is, in fact, how the whole industry began. It was because of all that nuclear uh, uh, cost overruns and all the graffiti on the nuclear plants and all the, all the, all the, you know, if there was a little accident, everybody started suing and the cost started skyrocketing of these nuclear plants. And then they said, no, 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 we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to build simple little gas plants. And, and, and for those gas plants, you're going to get your, we're going to get a fixed price. We're going to get a fixed price at the time of our financial close, and we're not going to change it. That means that the investor takes that risk, the same with the delay risk. And that's implemented. That delay risk is implemented through liquidated damages. So if you're delayed, you've got to take money out of your pocket and give it back to that, 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 uh, 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 off taker, the, the 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 renter in our car example. Efficiency, same deal. We want to buy this uh, 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 whatever the 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 off taker is renting this the, this this machine, and if you just let it fall apart, it's kind of like the availability. So the whole business is picking things. Fuel price, uh -huh, that's a little different. If the fuel price suddenly goes up in the whole economy, well, the, the, the investor cannot control that. So the classic answer is don't take macro kind of risks because if you took those risks, just like that rental car company, you'd start increasing the price. You'd make downsides and it would be a really kind of inefficient thing to do. Everybody would try to price in risks. I don't know exactly what would happen. Perhaps you could do forward contracts. We could get fancy. Things get a little more nuanced. The operation and maintenance cost, you agree on an operation and maintenance. If you start paying all your employees for writing graffiti on the plant, you don't want to do that. The, 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 the invest the the off taker the buyer does not want to pay that 
blah, blah, blah. But then you get into inflation risk. I don't know who should take that sometimes. And you could argue both ways. Same with changes in the interest rates and the cost of capital. Things get a little bit blurry. On the construction overrun risk, what happens if steel prices go up and you can't control steel prices? You can say, ah, and, and I've seen this, and they, the contracts have to get a little more sophisticated. They have to get a little more sophisticated. So that's just a little background. And the nuances, nuances are the interesting things in life. And then we have part two. Part one was investor versus uh, 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 owner versus renter, if we think about our rental car company. Part two is you have a whole bunch of different people in your diagram, and then you allocate the risks. Okay? So the... You allocate, and, and I used to think, oh, this is violating Modigliani and Miller. Modigliani and Miller were so brilliant, Miller at least was. Basically saying contracts, you can just figure out your own contracts. You can figure out this. Project finance kind of different. If you sign a contract, you, you, you want the, the, the off-taker of the contract, which is the EPC provider, the o &M provider, the supply provider, you want them, because they can control things, you want them to take the risk, and the idea is they'll do it more efficiently, but it doesn't always work. It can really get messed up with things like country risk premiums. Okay, so that's our central philosophical point. I don't have to go through this. Now let's talk about this double plan. Okay, double was a three billion, and it was it, it even ties into our last one. It was liquefied uh, uh, natural gas just from over there across the, the, the sea a little bit. So it probably wasn't, you know, in, in, in theory, Qatar could have made that gas really cheap, perhaps, but of course, they charged the price of oil, they linked it to the price of oil, so it wasn't that cheap. It was started way back in 1992. It's another ancient history. It was supposed to give 2,000 megawatts. This is not a little plant. This is a big plant. 2,000 megawatts. Wow. And it had the strongest off-takers. Uh, uh, if you think Enron was some kind of sleazy company, you're probably right. But at that time, they were looked at as the brilliant company in the en energy industry, better even than, than Exxon Mobil. And it also had GE and Bechtel. GE was the most valuable company in the world at that time. It's kind of come down. Bechtel was the construction company who could do anything. And its president was a guy named, a man named Dick Cheney before he went and became vice president of the U.S. So they were pretty big companies, so we have good off-takers, and then they, they, they got the LNG from Qatar and Oman. Here is this quote from, and I've, I've read this to you, and I've, I've done this quite a few times, and I have a different opinion about it now. Here's Rebecca Monk and the, the Harvard case study. As they inched along Marine Drive, Rebecca Mark and Joe Sutton had talked about the past. Oh, their company, Enron Development Company, the greatest company ever, had attempting entry into the huge Indian market. It was headed by Rebecca, its youthful, energetic president and CEO. I, wonder, I don't know where she was from, actually. LinkedIn, LinkedIn or something. Here's what she said. We are a very uh, eclectic, eclectic bunch with some ex-military, ex-entrepreneurs. Uh, we brought together a, with a certain amount of missionary zeal. Oh, my gosh, which I think you should have in this business. It demands so much of what you have to do, all those contracts you have to sign and everything else. I think it's got to be good for the country. They get the economy moving by bringing power in. These plants are economically in fire. And then this one. We are bringing a market mentality and spreading the privatization gospel in countries that desperately need this type of thinking. Now, there are accusations. I'm not going to say about that. I, I, I don't know. 
Okay. Here's what. When this kind of crap is presented in a case study at Harvard Business School with all, I imagine one of those big rooms where they're all, where they're all, you know, talking and trying to be smarter than everybody else and talking about fancy things and, you know, whatever, really big terms and, you know, whatever. I can imagine the points they try to sound brilliant on. My God, do they really think like this? Do the people who wrote this case up not understand how preposterous it is to think like this, to be this arrogant, to think you can get away with this kind of stuff? Oh, well, let's continue with this case just a minute. I think I'm going to stop with it after this one. So here was the project, and, and it had a sources and uses of fun statement just like the, the other one. And then here's a diagram of the project. Now this man is Richard Tinsley. I taught this. It's not funny. I met Richard Tinsley a few times. I think he was Australian, but he worked at Continental Bank in Chicago. And he, he, he taught this stuff way before me. And I think he was good. Unfortunately, I have to dedicate this video to him because he's, he, he's no longer with us, okay? But he made this cool thing. Can you imagine how long it took? And he said, okay, here's the PPA. And I think this is really good. Here's the Reserve Bank of India. Here, here's the government of Maharashtra. They had a full guarantee because they owned the off-taker. And there was a, some other state support agreement. God knows what that is. The government of India, even outside of Maharashtra, made some limited guarantee. Whenever it says limited, I think, hmm probably doesn't mean a thing. Comfort letter probably doesn't mean anything. And then the banks themselves, and, and here's the financing of these banks, the, the, the banks themselves, you know, this was uh, what, what, whatever, 2.4 billion, 2.4 billion of debt. A lot of debt. But they got a political risk guarantee, the Exim especially. I, I don't know if the other ones did. There, there was some OPEC guarantees. So yeah, the, the other thing I just want to say is in these type of structures, just to illustrate this, I, this is kind of maybe silly, I would put what's in the PPA contract. That defines everything. And if you have a PPA agreement with a, with a, 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 a penalty, you charge some of the penalties in the O&M contract, you charge some of the penalties in the EPC contract, like if the off-taker says you're going to be, if you're going to be late, you're going to have to pay a penalty, a liquidated damage penalty, then it goes here. Same with the fuel contract. Everything is connected and you can structure these contracts really carefully, but you have to make sure this off-taker is okay. And that's why Richard Tinsley made this diagram. And then, here's what I did, in, then you look more carefully, and here's another diagram, and every time Enron or, or, or Bechtel was in this one, so of course these people pay, Enron isn't there. There's the, there's the guarantees that I tried to kind of copy from Richard. Uh, uh, the EPC contract was managed by Enron, and if you think Enron isn't making any money from this, or Bechtel or GE isn't making any money, I think you maybe are a little naive. Here's Enron in this one. Enron is the, is the sponsor, and I tried to diagram some of this stuff out. I don't know if I did this well. And, and, and then I think we, this, I've kind of given you the answer. I'm not going to look at that. And then here's what Enron did. Aha! They won the award of the year. Project Finance Structuring of the Year somehow in that. And they must have gone to an Academy Award and maybe, maybe uh, 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 I hear Rebecca, who, I'll give you a hint, she did get her MBA at, she, uh, at Harvard. She's going to say, oh, thank you, Harvard. Thank you, professors, for teaching me about projects. Thank my secretary for typing up all that document. Oh, 
gosh, I want to thank all these people, okay? Huh, okay. Now, in the case, in the case, they gave you, they, they, they gave you a, a layout of the PPA contract, and I am going to have you open a file again and try to understand things from reviewing a financial model. So here's what I'm going to pause it for a minute. Come on. So it, 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 here's the little excerpt from the case. I didn't give you the whole thing, so I shouldn't be in trouble. Okay. Here's the discussion, and they, they say that this is a <clears throat> a, 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 a 2,000 megawatt plant that cost 2.8 billion. Here's this wonderful quote that I just take more seriously. And then they give you a, a kind of one of the last pages. They give you the uh, uh, layout. Now, if you ever have KWH, please, it's a small K and a big W for Mr. James Watt and a small H for our. Okay? K is 1,000 Watt. Is James Watt, so he capitalized the W. Ugh. You see this. And then they say the plant was assumed to run 8760, and if you take, uh, everybody should know this, if you take 365 times 24, uh, you get 8760. Okay, that's the hours in the year. It was assumed to never have a holiday, never have a downtime for maintenance, Never have a, a, what you call a forced outage, which is a sick day. Okay, it's crazy. Okay, but we'll go with it. And it says it's from Enron, so God knows kind of why they did this. And, and this goes totally against this whole idea of an of a, of a, a, a availability kind of project, which is, 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 uh, the availability project, excuse me, why can't, oh, I see, I see. Now, this is an excerpt, so they give you, here's the idea, debt service tax shareholders return, that's called the capacity payment, and that's generally fixed. You get that no matter if they don't ask you to ever run the plant, and they get you to to get it. So this, this debt service tax and shareholders return, that gives you, that covers both the interest and the principal on the debt plus the, plus the return of and on capital, okay? The fixed O&M here is, is uh, 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 the, 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 the fixed O&M, and notice these are all in per kilowatt hour. This, this covers your, your, your fixed costs of maintaining the plant, which is not fuel, and then they have variable costs, and the reason you have variable costs is these depend on how much you run the plant. They're assuming it runs every single hour of the day, which is, of course, crazy, but they have fixed and variable. This is the key number. And notice how this escalates. And uh, uh, these may or may not cover some cost, but remember... We had this diagram, so even if you can inflate costs, you can play so many games, and they're good. Some of these games are really good because Enron earns the fuel management fee, all the construction costs, which are financed by debt and equity, they could be inflated. Uh, uh, the O&M contractor is Enron itself. It could, not it could, it was making a margin. So this doesn't really give you the entire story. That's the first thing to understand. Understand. I say that probably in an irritating way. Understand. And then this was the total price of power that went way up, started low, went way up. So Enron could say, ah, oh, this is an economic price of power. Okay. And then what you can do is take this and just multiply it out. So this number here, straight from the case, this number here, we can put the hours in, 8760 hours, take the capacity price, multiply it by the hours, 
and then you can get the price per I, I did it per megawatt hour and you can get the total revenues now to that I added the fuel management fee and that's how not counting the margins you're making on the EPC contract and other things that's how much you're making just for being an investor plus the fuel management fee that's our revenues and then uh, 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 I don't know why I put this cost per kilowatt hour but this uh, and, and you know what I should do is is move this down here because we want to put the basically the capacity revenues which essentially are the EBITDA that's what I should have emphasized much more and then to get our cash flow I just want you to make a calculation whoops okay I gotta do this oh, you're so much better at me than this well oh no okay whoops oh shit okay oh and I said a swear word uh -uh. control R. okay I don't know why that took me so long and then you can see oh what's the project IRR before any financing and then I had somebody in my class who was brilliant 22 percent project IRR and then we can compute debt service now what I want people to do is to be able to say okay and we're going to assume that this debt service in cover it covers the entire lifetime so I better put up here I better put one and then I put alt EIS and uh, uh, put uh, 20 uh, and, and that's how much they just had 20 years okay and then you go down oh I'm gonna have to put this on the website I guess and then we compute the payment just like a mortgage payment PMT everybody should know this and and I derived that it was a 6.5% rate and we put the 20 years and then we put a minus on the on the debt or, or the 75% of the total cost that's the uh, 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 that's the uh, shift control one and then I'm, I'm just gonna put uh, whoops f4 oh do I do have to do this crap again oh shoot no oh, oh no fine I'm just gonna do it like this okay that's our debt service and then we can say the equity cash flow is simply the net cash flow from EBITDA minus the debt service of course if you have taxes you'd have to adjust that and there could have been taxes here or they, uh, you, you know they could have got a tax break but the equity cash flow right at the beginning was this amount and then you add back I should have put the debt financing right here I should let's do that like that so the debt financing is about 75 percent of the total capex and so we our total equity cash flow is the amount you take out of your pocket plus the amount you put back in and you get the IRR okay and that's all you have to do oops <laughs> Uh, uh, plus the debt okay and they got a 55 percent return okay maybe less for taxes whatever and then you can even compute the levelized cost uh, which uh, computed that that's not exactly correct okay whatever uh, uh, that's the levelized cost of the capacity I gotta fix that now so we did that hmm is that good well yeah then it should be so good in fact this i argue that starting to see just how what 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 a crazy thing this was was a little bit bad then we go to the off taker and it's really hard to get these exact so i first have to convert from rupee to, to usd and and we we account for the the losses that these companies had these losses some of the losses are called non-technical losses which is a name for stealing uh, uh, stealing electricity and I couldn't do it exactly I don't know when exactly this plant went online but in 1998 if this plant went online in 1998 we had these fixed capacity charges and compared to the total operating costs 
of the utility, these fixed capacity charges were this, and here's the problem, the cost of energy, the cost of energy was a lot lower than the cost of energy from this plant that they were forcing you to dispatch, so there was a big cost of uneconomic generation, and the total cost of this plant, which gave you a little bit of extra capacity was 48% of the total operating costs of the company. And you have to ask yourself, so that created the need for a big rate increase, and can you imagine the politics? Can you imagine, and I went back somewhere else and found all the uh, 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 clippings and everything else, they still, if you even mention it today, people go a little bit crazy about it. A dramatic price increase that caused the losses to go up. If the losses go up, they collect less money and the, the whole thing turns into a spiral. So the big question, even though these contracts were structured so carefully, could it ever have been done? I argue that this number, something like this number, was the most important number in the whole case. And how, and, and, and so when you make your diagram, whoops, uh, uh, if, you, if you make your diagram, ah, I didn't want to do that. Where are we? If you make your diagram, I did it right here. They need a 27 to 30% rate increase. And can you imagine the politics of that kind of rate increase? And there was an election, and the BJP versus the other one, it was an enormous issue. And let's finish it off. So they didn't pay, they made any kind of excuse not to why this contract wasn't appropriate. They shut down the plant, started it, shut down, started it. They did anything to, to, to ruin it if you don't have a good relationship, this contract doesn't mean anything, that was kind of interesting. Of course, none of these guarantees meant anything at all, they just weren't, who cares, there's no way. Uh, 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 the, in terms of the OPIC and the lenders, well, the, 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 uh, 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 whatever, uh, 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 they would have said, OPIC would have said, okay, I got to pay back the debt for you because it's a default on the contract. But then they would have got their own experts and said, oh my gosh, you should have realized that this plant was completely economic and the World Bank, in fact, didn't lend to you. So you go into court for a long time to try to realize these kind of guarantees you have. It's called political risk insurance can be really really difficult in practice. So the way political risk insurance says you buy, you pay a lot of money to get insurance for the fact that these people won't pay the PPA contract. That's the real risk. You can call it all kinds of other crap, maybe nationalization risk, but they're not going to nationalize this plant. They don't want it. Uh, 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 so that's the real risk. And, and then it goes into court. And, okay. So that happened. Enron, in the meantime, kind of fell apart for various reasons. I think this plant was a little bit behind it, not completely, obviously. And then, uh, 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 well, I don't know if you remember, I, I talked about a man named Dick Cheney. Okay, well, there were meetings between the politicians and, and, you know, I think there was a delegation that went to, the, to, to India to talk about China and India and everything else and all that stuff, whatever. But what was you, the, the first thing on the list, the first thing on the list for the U.S., the very, very first thing was this plant. So at the end of the day, in, in the uh, uh, PPA contract, it says, if they don't honor X, Y, Z, and there's kind of an A and a B provision, if they don't honor all that, well, here's what happens. You have to pay off the investors, 
you have to pay them off. Sometimes it's the net present value of the capacity charges, <laughs> which could be a lot. Sometimes it's just the value of the plant. You can probably negotiate it afterwards, but it's probably officially the NPV, because if it ran for five years, you know, you want the NPV of the remaining capacity charges. They all have these kind of provisions in there, and they eventually got paid. <laughs> okay, so that's... What a wonderful case. What, a, what, what, what that, that case just has, has, has too much in it. I don't even know how to teach it really anymore because it's just got so much stuff. And I'm going to stop the video. I talk about Euro Tunnel here, which is another wonderful case because they, the, 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 the way they signed the contracts was so good. And I even went back and retyped in some of the original documents and then I have a, 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 a uh, just a regular old uh, solar case but we you know I'm going to talk about that in the context of, of contracts I think so that's enough of this case